I want to uh, I want to address. Let's go back to property management just for one second, because I get a commonly asked question, and it occurred to me today in my car that uh, we didn't go over it last night. I don't know that it's testing material or not, but it's still related to real estate and all the things that we're talking about, and it kind of ties everything in. So, so the question is, if I'm hired as a property manager, and later the owner decides to sell their investment home that I've been managing. Can I be the listing agent? And the answer, honestly, is it depends. So what it's going to depend on, first and foremost, is does your firm policy do showing, do listings? Because some firms do listings, some firms do property manager, some firms do both, but the firm's policy would have to allow it. The second thing was, do you have the tools and the resources? Do you have a for sale sign? Do you have a lock box? Do you, you know, have access to MLS that you can get it, get it listed? Um, if your firm policy does not allow you to list, then you just refer it to your buddy down the street and take a, a referral fee. However, if your firm's policy, if you do have the resources to list it, this is what I need you guys to understand. You can't list it under a property management agreement. The property management agreement allows you to manage the property, not sell it. Remember our agency agreements are for a very specific thing. So if you have the resources and your firm policy allows, then you just need to enter into an exclusive right to sell listing agreement with that owner. But I think it's a good reminder. Like I said, our agency agreements are very specific. I'm not being hired to do anything and everything, right? The listing agreement, I'm being hired to list and sell the home. The buyer's agency agreement, I'm being hired to help them find and purchase a home. The property management agreement, I'm being hired to manage their property. So I think that is a good serves as a good reminder, you know, um, and it could have a case if you have an investor with 10 homes that you've been that you've been managing and all of a sudden they want to retire and sell those 10 homes. Um, it'd be a good to have a idea of how you are able to respond to that. Again, do you take the listing yourself or do you refer them down the street? There is verbiage in your property management agreement that covers that. But again, it doesn't give us permission to list it. Do you have any questions or comments on that? Make you think? Hey, Julie, I have a question. It's not really related to that, but it is about property management. Um, in order to be a property manager of like a, a an apartment complex, do you have to have a real estate license? To be a property manager, you have to have an active license because you're involved in the transfer of real property for others for compensation. Mm -hmm. You can work for a property manager as an unlicensed person, but the person that calls themselves the property manager has got to be licensed. And it's not uncommon. I mean, property managers have lots of unlicensed employees. They even have provisional brokers. So we got kind of think in that sense, Kelly, kind of think is the property manager is the broker in charge, right? They're the one kind of overseeing everything and they're responsible for everything that happens in their property management firm. Good question, thank you. Anybody going into property management now that we had our conversation last night? Did we change anybody? <laughs> I'm getting harder nose tonight than I did last night. So guys, just remember, we gotta get you through the test. The other thing I want, I have an announcement. We had a, um, we had to make a slight change today. Um, your cram course on Saturday, you still have a cram course on Saturday, but instead of Annie, it's now gonna be with Jane and your times are a little bit different. It's gonna be 9.15 to one o'clock. Um, Jane's cram course is different than Annie's. So now this kind of works out because you guys have two opportunities, uh, one with Jane this Saturday and the next one with Annie the next. But I did just want you to make this note. Um, so Friday, Lane is going to email you Jane's Zoom link. 
So that way you know where to go on Saturday morning. Um, you'll be with Jane from 9.15 to 1. Questions or comments on that? Again, the one you guys, if you're going to come, the one you want to try to come to is this Saturday. Remember the one on March 4th. This is at your exam is March 2nd. So this one is after your exam. But if you are getting ready for your state exam or if you are getting ready for the retake, then you have this opportunity on March 4th as well. Don't forget your retake is Monday, March 6th. If you don't pass the exam on the 2nd, but you at least make a 50%, you will be eligible for the retake. It's a free second try, you guys. And I'm here to tell you, not all schools offer that. So if you get test jitters, if you, if you ever run into a wall and say, I've never seen this stuff before in my entire life, um, we're gonna talk about some tricks next week to help you maybe get past some of that. But if for some reason you make you don't pass, but you make at least a 50%, um, you're eligible for the retake on March 2nd. And again, more instruction about all this coming out uh, next week as we get closer. So March 6th is your retake. March 2nd is your final. February 25th from 9.15 to 1, you're with Jane, email coming out. If you don't make a 50%, do we have to retake the class? Yes, you've got to keep going until you get that certificate of completion. You can't go on to the next step. So if you don't make a 50% or you don't pass the retake, you get to retake the class. I do know Lane will let you retake it for a discount. So there's that. Guys, this is a lot of information. We agree? I believe I stood here on the first day and said, this is a lot of information, you guys. How hard can it be? She's paid to say that. So I hope I've uh, proven my point. <laughs> this is a lot of information and it's a lot to take in. And I know we talked last night about, some of you feel like you're drinking from a fire hydrant right now. And that's a very common scenario. It's just, uh, it is what it is. I always say, if somebody ever told you getting your license was easy, they lie to you. Straight up lie. Anything on dates? I've reloaded this in our online learning system. So your schedule, again, under our Campbell folder. And I put a, a revision date on it in case you're not sure which is the old, which is the new. So I just updated this uh, this afternoon. Okay, we good? All right, unit 19, fair housing. This is a big one. This is a big, big unit. You're gonna get fair housing training and post licensing. You're gonna see it in CE. It's going to pop up in your firm's training. It's gonna pop up in your local board of realtor training. Um, fair housing is just one of those ongoing things um, to make sure all agents are in compliance. Here's the deal with fair housing, you guys. Fair housing is not here for you to agree with or disagree with. Fair housing is what it is. And failure to comply with fair housing will get you in trouble, not only with the North Carolina Real Estate Commission, but possibly also um, HUD, Housing of Urban Development. We'll talk about that in a minute. Could be in the court of law. I mean, it's violations of fair housing have tremendous repercussions. So it's really important that we understand it. Uh, I feel like this unit kind of introduces you to it, gives you the basis. Again, understanding that uh, you'll get more and more. And I got some really good resources for you guys as well that we'll look at when we're done with this unit. So starting on page 476, our roadmap for this unit we're gonna talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and federal fair housing. We're gonna define the classes of protected, or excuse me, the protected classes. 
So who are the classes? And we're gonna define what each of the protected classes are. And then we're gonna talk about federal fair housing. We got state fair housing. North Carolina has their own level of fair housing. Um, and who enforces each federal and state and how that works. The big picture of fair housing, the big, big picture of fair housing says that everybody should have the right to live wherever they want to, as long as it's within their financial needs. So anybody and everybody should be able to live wherever they want to, for sale or for rent, wherever they want to, as long as it's within your financial means. And one big thing in real estate that helps let the public know that we abide by fair housing is our equal opportunity in housing. You guys may recognize this logo. Um, you see it on all of our forms, practically anything real estate. You see our equal housing opportunity logo. And that just lets the public know that we participate in equal housing opportunities uh, for the protected classes. Responsibility for complying with equal opportunity in housing, of course, real estate agents, that's why we're talking about it. But apartment management companies, lending agencies, builders, developers, pretty much every phase of the real estate transaction. When you're dealing with the public in real estate, we're making sure that we're in Com complying with fair housing. And I need you guys to hear me when I talk about fair housing. This is referring to residential. This is not commercial. Commercial doesn't have the fair, same fair housing. So when we talk about fair housing, we're talking about residential that includes for sale and for lease, for rent, sell properties and rental properties. So let's start with a little history lesson. And let's go back in time to 1866. Uh, what was going on at the, in, in 1866? You guys remember what was happening? No, you don't remember. <laughs> what was going on in 1866? Julie? Yeah. I'm sorry to back up a few seconds here you said it's for not for commercial correct but, it is so, uh, so a hundred unit apartment complex has different rules to follow well don't they provide housing well they do but they're commercial but they provide housing that's what we're talking about is dwellings where people live all right so may it be for sale or may it be for rent it's a house it's providing housing so you're right those large apartment complexes and what makes them interesting, Tom, is they get to abide by fair housing and ADA, American with Disability Act. Nice. So they got several things to consider. Okay. Thanks. So when we talk about housing, yep, good question. Thank you. When we talk about housing, we're referring to residential where people live for sale and for rent. Um, so what was happening, 1866? Well, the Civil War was ending. Um different laws, different restrictions were coming out. And one of the big things that came as a result was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And what this did was prohibit discrimination on the basis of race and color. The couple unique things about the Civil Rights Act of 1866, first off, this is one of our longest standing acts. This act is, act is still in place today. We have built on it, since 1866, but the foundation, the origination started in 1866. We're gonna talk about race and color in just a second. We're gonna define the protected classes. So bear with me for a second. So the rule is still enforceable today. Again, we've built on it. The other thing that makes this unique, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, this is like the one piece of this unit that isn't just about housing. When we say no exemptions are allowed, we're referring to no discrimination on the basis of race and color in housing, commercial, employment, a pickup game of basketball, anything. We are never allowed to discriminate on the basis of color and race. Zero exemptions. Again, not just specific to housing. So it all started in 1866. Fast forward 
1968. What is that, 102 years later? Fast forward, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 evolved into Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, also known as Federal Fair Housing Act. And in 1968, we said race and color was still protected, still protected class. But in 1968, we added religion and national origin. Again, defining all these in just one second. So 1866 was race and color. Fast forward to 1968. We evolved and we added religion and national origin. Fast forward again one more time to 1974. In 1974, sex became a protected class. Continuing to evolve, just February of 2021, is that right? 21, I guess so. Um, or yeah, 21. February of 21, sex, the protected class of sex began to include sexual orientation and gender identity. So things are still evolving. Again, we'll talk more about that. Then fast forward again one more time. Evolved again to 1988, handicap condition, handicap disability condition, and familiar status. Are y'all seeing these dates? 1974, 1988, this wasn't that terribly long ago, was it? And things continue to evolve, we continue to grow as our society does, as our culture does. Look with me, if you will, there's a great chart in your book on page 477. And I like this chart because it kind of shows us what protected class became protected and when. So it shows, shows us the evolution. The last one you're looking at there, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974, that's the protected classes of our lenders. Uh, we looked at the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974 in unit 15, I think. And you can see they have similar protected classes, but there are a few differences. Again, I really like this chart because it gives us a nice side-by-side -side comparison. You need to know the protected classes, talking more about those. I also think you guys should know the years. I think you should know the years and here's why. I wouldn't put it past them on the test to say something like the year is 1970. And a woman applied for apartment and was declined because she's a female. Was that allowed? Well, in 1970, could they deny her an apartment because she was a female? Absolutely. So knowing the protected classes is one thing, but knowing when they became a protected class, I think may give you an advantage. So again, I draw you back to that chart on page 477, I think it does a good job of showing what became when. So let's talk about the protected classes. Let's define what these protected classes are. And one method to remember the protected classes is to think of Fred's corn. So if we break this down per Fred's corn, the F in Fred's corn is familiar status. Familiar status is about the children. Familiar status is about those that are 18 years and younger. It's not about the adults. It's about the children. And this does include pregnant women, women with child. I don't know that there's much um, wrong that goes on in a for sale situation. I think where this really applies more is the for lease situation. Landlords can't deny rent, can't deny a unit to rent because the family has children. The first R is race. 
Race refers to the group of people that the individual was born or has affiliated with their whole lives. So various physical or genetic traits shared by the group that the person affiliates with. The E in Fred's corn isn't a protected class, it's just a filler. So we can spell Fred. The D in Fred's corn is referring to disability handicap status. Uh, this is protecting any physical, anyone with a physical or mental impairment, some kind of impairment that limits one or more of life's major activities, some kind of handicap or disability. Y'all remember back in unit seven, we were talking about material facts and we were talking about things that aren't material facts. And one thing we said that was not a material fact was a stigmatized property. And when we were talking about stigmatized properties, we said there was one exception to that rule. Does anybody remember that exception to the stigmatized properties? Yeah. There was for HIV. Yeah. If we're ever asked, did somebody ever live in this home that had AIDS or HIV? Our answer is always, federal fair housing prohibits me from answering that. Federal fair housing prohibits me from answering that. We'll talk more about what happens when we get asked questions. Uh, sex is referring to somebody's gender. Again, make yourself a note in your book on page 477. You guys see where it says male or female gender and then it says does not protect sexual orientation or gender identity. Cross that out as of February 2021. Very proud to say sexual orientation and gender identity are now covered under protected class. Covered under sex. The C in corn is referring to the color, the color of an actual color of a person's skin. The O is not a protected class. Again, I'm just using it for a filler so we can spell corn. Religion is referring to somebody's spiritual, spiritual beliefs. And then national origin is the country that the individual was born or where their direct ancestors hail from. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of these again, just introducing you to what these mean. This is the deal with the protected classes. Fair housing does not say, these are the protected classes, don't you say anything bad about it. What fair housing says is, these are the protected classes, do not say anything at all. They're protected. These classes are protected. So even if we're saying something good, fair housing says, no, that's not what this is about. The fact that somebody has children or the fact the color of somebody's skin or somebody's religion should have no impairment, no impact whatsoever on their ability to live wherever they want to, as long as they're living within their, finan within their financial means. And that's what fair housing says. Guys, remember what we said when we talked, we were an agency, said we can talk about the property all day long. We can't talk about the people. Here we are again in fair housing. We can talk about the property, the amenities nearby, the location. We can babble on about all that all day long. We cannot talk about the people because the people are protected. They fall under one of uh, whichever category here. If they're not on this list, if a, if a class isn't on this list, they're not protected. So for example, could you discriminate against somebody's religious, political, not religious, I'm sorry, political views? Could you discriminate on somebody based on their political views? 
Sure, political affiliation is not a protected class. Discriminate away. Uh, I'll tell you guys about what, seven years ago, give or take, my husband sent me an article. It went down in California. It always goes down in California, doesn't it? Sent me an article, a woman put her house up for sale. And in her public remarks, she said, Trump supporters not welcome. Does she violate fair housing? No. Do you think there were people, even Trump supporters that didn't want to deal with this woman? Because come on, you know, money's money, right? If you want to buy my house, I don't care who you vote for. But to her point, she did nothing wrong. What if you have an apartment to rent? You don't want to rent it to real estate agents because you know we don't get paid consistent income. Can you say broker's not welcome? Is job a protected class? This is what we mean by the protected classes, you guys. You can talk about anything else. These are the classes that are protected. These are the classes that Fair Housing steps in and says, we cannot discuss these amenities the, or these protected classes. <clears throat> There is um, equal housing opportunity, opportunity is enforced by HUD. HUD is the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And one thing that HUD requires is that a poster be on display in places where public can access, real estate firms, lenders offices, um, uh, model homes, if you go to a new construction model home. So there's an example of this poster on page 478. And HUD says by providing this poster, by putting this poster in your office where the public can see it, you are letting the public know that you follow fair housing, that you follow equal opportunity in housing. And as a matter of fact, HUD actually says that failure to display the poster Failure to have this poster available is considered discrimination. HUD considers failure to display this poster discrimination because if you don't have this up, you're not telling the public that we don't discriminate. So it's gotta be in all of our brokerage offices, model homes, lenders offices, anywhere the public is gonna go, the public's gonna have access to. There's good stuff all throughout this unit. Um, I would make yourself a note, for example, on page 479. There's some prohibited acts and some specific examples. I got lots of examples for you guys with this because I do think it helps. It, it takes more real world situations. So make yourself a note on page 479. You wanna look at that, get a better understanding. And then at the bottom of 479, we're gonna do some expanded definition. So um, we mentioned housing. This is about housing. Housing is referring to the dwelling, the place designed for occupancy, the, 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 the space designed to live there. It's the dwelling, it's where we live. Familia status, again, is protecting children and pregnant women, uh, those with children. Again, I, and I'm not saying this doesn't come up in for sale. Of course it does. But I think where we see this the most is in for lease situations. Uh, landlords may think they don't want to rent to kids because, you know, kids destroy things and they color purple crayon on the walls and they tear stuff up and, right, they just, they just damage all sorts of stuff. And landlords may say, I don't want dogs and I don't want kids. And that's why the children are protected. People cannot be denied housing because they have children. What does come up for sale is when we're working with buyers and buyers look at you and say, are there kids in the neighborhood? Is there somebody here for my kid to play with? Again, I can't talk about the people. I can talk about the amenities. Well, there's the school. This is the school board it's in. And there's a park nearby. And if you drive down the street, you might see a kid or two, right? I mean, 
we're encouraging our buyers to drive around the neighborhood anyway. But as far as specifically addressing whether or not there are kids in the neighborhood, that's a topic we got to stay away with. So when these questions come up, we're directing them back to the amenities, what's in the neighborhood, what's lo located by. If they want somewhere for their kids to play, then they're probably looking for a neighborhood in a good school district, maybe with a park nearby, somewhere that the kids can access. We're talking about the property and the amenities all day long. But the thing is, fair housing says we can't hide our head in the sand. We can't dodge these questions. A large part of what we do is educate the public. And when it comes to fair housing, this is where uh, we really are helping the public understand. So when you are asked, are there kids in this neighborhood? Address it head on directly say, fair housing says that the children are a protected class and we can't talk about the kids. Let's go back to the for lease. For a second, let's say you have this large apartment complex and let's say it's downtown, I don't know, it's a 20 story building. And you have a family that applies for a unit on the 19th floor and there's a balcony and they have three small kids. You as the property manager may be a little nervous about renting something on that 19th floor to a family with three small kids. Can I deny them that housing because they have kids? Can I deny them that unit on the 19th floor because they have kids? No, we cannot deny them housing. If they decide they don't wanna live there because it's on the 19th floor, that's up to them. If they decide they want to live there, but I can't say something like, oh, that's no longer available once I see the children. You guys see what I'm saying? And it sounds like I'm doing good, right? It sounds like I'm trying to protect these kids Everybody should have the right to live where they want as long as it's within their financial means. So if the family with small kids wants to live on the 19th floor, I need to run up there and make sure the balcony is reinforced real good, don't I? I need to make sure that it's safe. As long as they qualify. Again, Fair Housing says, this is on us. This is our rule. Don't try to hide from it. Don't try to run away from it address it. And just because there are kids in the neighborhood, I'm still not going to guarantee that they'll get along with yours. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But seriously, um, you're going to get asked that quite a bit. So point out the amenities, point out the locations, point out what's nearby. Schools are a huge thing uh, with families with kids. They want to be in certain school districts or not. You're gonna get asked, well, what? I don't, I don't know the schools. Are the schools here good or bad? That's it. That's a be the source of the source. Again, I don't know your children. I don't know what special accommodations they may need, may need. So when you ask me if this is a good school district, I'm gonna refer you to that school's website or that county's like, you know, Forsyth County Schools website. I'm gonna refer you to that so you can look that up, do your research and determine what's best for your children. Questions on familial status, all about the children. Notice we didn't say anybody was protected after you turn 18, as far as age goes, right? So you can you discriminate against old people if you want to? Yeah, they're not protected. I'd be careful, but you're, you guys are getting my point here, right? It's just the protected classes. And with familial status, it's just those under the age of 18. So if they ask questions implying what they mean, like, is this a quiet neighborhood? So that's a great question. You're good. Is this a quiet neighborhood? Well, what are you digging at here? You know, are you trying to find out if there's kids up and down the street? Do the people next door party? You know, again, when you're asked questions like that, I think the best recommendation we can give is to encourage them to drive through the neighborhood at different times of the day, different times of the week. You know, if you're worried about the neighbor partying, drive by at 10 o'clock on Friday night and see if it's quiet. If you're worried about um, you know, kids playing in the street in the middle of the afternoon, drive by then. But I think buyers, even putting fair housing aside, I think buyers should be encouraged to drive by the home, drive through the neighborhood several times as part of their 
contract the closing process so they can get a feel for what the neighborhood's like. Uh, the other one here is handicap disability status. Um, in a for lease situation, landlords need to allow anybody with a handicap disability status to make um, accommodations to the property. So, for example, if somebody wants to uh, rent your investment home and they are in a wheelchair then the landlord has to allow the tenant to put a ramp in, for example, maybe lower the kitchen cabinets. The landlord can't deny the tenant the ability to make the accommodations to the home to make it usable for this person with a handicapped disability status. Um, grab bars in the showers, for example. The landlord doesn't have to pay for it. The landlord can make the tenant pay for it. And a lot of times there are programs in place to help handicapped disability tenants to make those accommodations. The landlord can also require that it be put back to its original condition at the end of the lease. So if you have somebody with a wheelchair, we can allow them to put a ramp out front. We can allow, allow them to lower the cabinets. And at the end of the lease, the can dictate, it can state, that it needs to be put back to its original condition. Um, when it comes to making accommodations for tenants with handicapped disability status, uh, the only thing the landlord can't do is say no. The landlord has got to allow those accommodations, those modifications at the tenant's expense. We're gonna kind of do a nice side-by-side -side comparison on fair housing and um, American with disabilities at the end of this unit. If it's a housing, like fair housing, the land or the uh, tenants responsible for that. If it's a public accommodation, ADA says that the landlord is responsible for that. So the landlord's always responsible for common areas, public spaces, and they can't deny somebody making accommodations to the home for the tenant. Uh, also last night, we talked about a little bit about um, service animals. The landlord cannot deny a service animal. They can't charge a pet fee. They cannot deny a service animal. Understanding that service animal and emotional support animals are two different things. Right now, the only service animal recognized by um, ADA are dogs. They used to recognize miniature horses until a couple years ago. And right now it's just dogs. But somebody shows up with an emotional support animal and says, I need this. That's an agreement between the landlord and the tenant because it's not covered under ADA. Does that make sense? ADA just regulates the public spaces. Landlord and the tenant can agree to The other thing I want to point out about the handicap, uh, on page 480, page 480, the in practice down there, somebody that is in rehab for legal or illegal drugs is protected under handicap disability. So those that are seeking help, those that are seeking treatment are protected. Questions on handicap disability? I, I say, but because you're going to find another instructor that says disability, and they instead of Fred's corn, they use fresh corn. I tend to use, I choose to use handicap. So Fred's corn or fresh corn, we're saying handicap disability. That's the only thing that's changing. So I try to use both. Um, prepare you guys for uh, what you may see on your test and what you may see in future classes. So handicap disability, uh, both fall under the same the same category.
So as with anything else, there's some exceptions to fair housing. Fair housing does have some exceptions. Um, the sale or rent of a single family own. Somebody that is exempt that does not own more than three homes at a time. So for example, the investor that owns 10 home owns 10 homes, they're not exempt. The for sale by owner, they would fall under this category of being exempt. Now, before you get too excited on me, hang on, I got an answer. But technically the for sale by owner, according to fair housing, does not have to abide by fair housing. I got a solution to that, just please bear with me. Anytime a real estate agent is involved, once a broker gets involved, no exemptions. So if the fair housing, if the, excuse me, the for sale by owner chooses to discriminate, if they later hire an agent or if the buyer shows up with an agent, once you and I get involved in the transaction, there is never, never an exemption. So that for sale by owner, when you bring the buyer to the transaction, that for sale by owner can no longer get away with their exemption, with their discrimination. And the other thing that's never, ever allowed, it just is discriminatory advertising. You may have, um, you may have a duplex and you're not licensed and you may have a duplex and you may choose to have somebody the same gender as you live in the other unit. You're gonna live in one and somebody the same gender lives in the other. So you may say to yourself, I'm not gonna allow a male tenant. I just want a female to live there. I can't advertise that discrimination. I can't say males need not apply, for example females only. That's what we mean when we say you can't advertise that discrimination. As we said, if you have a rental in an owner-occupied one to four family dwelling, that would be exempt from fair housing. Remember, you just can't advertise. So you have that duplex, you live in one, you're trying to find a tenant for the other one. You can't advertise that discrimination. Um, any property owned by a religious organization, they can use it, that they use for their members. For example, think of like a, a church parsonage. They would be exempt from fair housing because that's just for use for the members, just for use for that religious organization. Same thing with private clubs. They can say this is only for our members. And then another big exemption, there is some housing set aside for older persons. It's built and designed for those that are 55 or older. That is allowed, but this is what we need to understand. The only protected class that we're exempted, exempting from this is familiar status. This does not give them a free ticket to discriminate against race, color, religion, national origin, et cetera. The only exemption to the housing for whole older persons is familiar status because it's designed for older persons. It was built, it's a community, a retirement community. And they can say no kids, that's the exemption. Again, they cannot deny because of your race, color, religion, national origin, et cetera. Uh, good question. What if they are a registered sex offender? Is that a protected class? The kids are what's protected. The sex offender is required by Megan's law. Let me rephrase that. The convicted sex offender is required by Megan's law to register their address. So those, their neighbors know that there's a convicted sex offender nearby. So the sex offender is not protected, but they do have, they do have their own set of rules under that Megan's law. Julie, I have a question. The first an owner occupied one to four family dwelling. So is that saying like, Basically, if I own a four unit apartment or something, 
and I live in one and then I can decide who lives in the other yeah. three. Okay. You just can't advertise your discrimination. Okay. You can't say men only or, you know, whatever, you, you know, Methodist only or, you know, whatever. You just can't advertise that discrimination. Okay, thank you. I had a, a student pre-licensed class a long time ago. We were still we were still face to face, and um, she shared with us that she had a, a friend that lived in a housing for older persons, and they were you know of age and they loved it there and everything. Uh, the grandkids can come visit. You know they can pack their little little backpacks and come stay the night at grandma's house. That's not a problem. The problem is that the grandkids can't live there. It's a housing for older persons. These people were the guardians to this child, these children, and these children lost their parents in a car accident. And the grandparents had to move because they were in a housing for older persons. That was their community. That was their development. There's a lot to think about, isn't there? There's a lot to think about. So who enforces fair housing? Well, we said it was by HUD. Specifically in HUD, we have the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. So the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. If somebody feels that they were discriminated against because of their membership of the protected class, the complainant has up to one year to file a complaint to HUD. One year after the discrimination happened to file the complaint. HUD will investigate it. They'll ask all parties involved. Uh, for the business, they're gonna wanna see their policies, their manual, their procedures their documentation. When they review the case, um, you know, if, if they do feel that, that if they do determine that discrimination has happened, um, disciplinary action will be taken. They can go after um, the one that did the discrimination in court. They can go to damages. I mean, we're talking like 10,000 for the first offense, 25 for the second and 50 after that. You don't need to know all that. But just know each time you get a complaint and you're found guilty, um, your violations, your fines go up. So there could be lawsuits, there could be penalties. And just one second, we're going to introduce you to North Carolina state housing. It wouldn't be uncommon for HUD to push the complaint down to the state level. If the state level got a complaint, push it up to HUD. Now we got both involved. We got fair housing and North Carolina state housing. Questions on federal fair housing. Is everybody seeing that word housing? This is so important that we see this because this is what distinguishes Fair housing from ADA, again, we'll do a nice side-by-side -side comparison, but we need to see the difference. Fair housing is about the dwelling. ADA is about the public accommodations, the public spaces. Question comes in, good question. But what about roommates when they ask for either females or only? Um, we're gonna see in just a second an exemption in state housing is gonna be like a, a dorm room situation. So if you're on campus, obviously you can only have you know your same sex. As far as off campus, do we see these ads all the time? Sure we do. Does that mean that they're in compliance with fair housing? Like I said, you can never ever discriminate your advertising. Fair housing is, they work hard. And I, I know I see it all the time. There's an apartment for rent.
So if this is federal fair housing, let's bring it down to the state level. North Carolina Fair Housing Act of 1983, here's the good news. The protected classes for North Carolina are the same as the protected classes for fair housing. So you guys only have to know one set of protected classes. If you were in California, I, I think they have like 15 or 16 protected classes. So they go above and beyond fair housing. Luckily, our protected classes here are the same as for federal. So Fred's corn applies to both. And there are a few differences and that's what we're gonna focus on with North Carolina fair housing. What are the differences? So for example, we said earlier that federal allows exemptions when the home is owned by someone that does not own more than three homes. In the state level, for sale by owner or for rent by owner is not exempt. Remember I told you when we met this to hang on, I got a solution for you. So now that we're in the state level, the for sale by owner and the for rent by owner are not exempt. They cannot discriminate. Every time, any time you have conflicting laws, the stricter of the two will prevail. So because North Carolina Fair Housing says FISBO or, or FERBO are not exempt, the stricter of the two prevails. And in North Carolina, the for sale by owner and the for rent by owner cannot discriminate. State's more strict than the federal, so the state will prevail. It, you know, and, and, and what we focus on with, the, I just got a, a question about the emotional support animals. And again, though, that really where that comes into play is with ADA, with the public accommodations. You guys remember, I don't remember, it's, it's been a couple of years now, and, and a lady tried to get on the airplane with her emotional support peacock. You just heard me right. She tried to get on an airplane with an emotional support peacock. And the airline said, yeah, no. And um, she fought it. I mean, she, she ended up getting some money and probably some frequent flyer miles and, you know, that kind of thing. But their stance was ADA says we only have to accommodate for service animals because an airport, an airplane is a public, is a public accommodations. Um, again, as far as housing goes, I mean, the landlord can't deny a service animal, right? They can't say, no, you can't have this dog and they can't charge a pet fee. But they, uh, you know, if you want to have your emotional support peacock live in this home, I would think that would be an agreement between, between the landlord and the tenant, whether or not that peacock is allowed in here or not. Do you know, is there any documentation? If somebody has a service animal, do they have paperwork or something that would indicate, prove that it's a service animal? They, they might, but here's the thing. The the owner of the public accommodations can't ask. Like they can ask, does this dog provide a need for you? But they can't demand to see the paperwork. So let's say, let's say you own a Lowe's hardware, for example, or a grocery store, and you have 15 or more employees. Remember that caveat about ADA, 15 or more employees. And somebody brings their dog into the grocery store. You can ask, does this dog provide a service for you? But you can't say, you know, what do you have? What does the dog do? Show me your paperwork. You, you know, you can't get in too specific. If they say yes, you have to allow them in. And guys, do people take advantage of this? I mean, all the time. We could probably go to Amazon on break and find a service animal vest for our dog, right? But that doesn't make it a service animal. So people take, unfortunately take advantage of this all the time. They can't be denied access, but here's the thing. If the animal goes into the public place and starts acting up, then they can be asked to leave because service animals don't act up. So if they get into Lowe's hardware and start jumping up and down on people and piddle on the floor, 
then they can be asked to leave because that's not how a service animal acts. acts. But they can't be, they can't be denied. You can't be bombarded with a lot of questions. I just, and one question, there's certain places that'll usually, um, I, I'd like tell you about a limit for like a, um, the size of it. Does that, would that not um, like, would that not pertain to that service animal? If, if it's a, and, and the land now, now we're back to fair housing, right? So if the, if the landlord, is this a service animal, you know, because they may have, like you said, there might be breed restrictions, size restrictions, you know, so that the landlord and the fair housing may be able to um, request certain paperwork because they're going to have to prove to their insurance company more than likely why we have this pit bull here, for example, you know, if they have that breed restriction. Um, so guy, please, ADA and fair housing are two different, you know, two different things. My, my husband and I are really big baseball fans and High Point got their stadium in 2019 and then, you know, the COVID hit. So the first year we had, we had, it was a lot of fun. And that first year we were there, I noticed practically every game we went to, there was, um, there was a lady in a wheelchair and she always sat at the concourse where she could see and always laying behind her wheelchair was this beautiful gold lab. And she had a little tent next, I mean, he was wearing a vest, but she had a little tent next to him that said, I am a service animal. Because think about all the things going on in a baseball game. You know, there's noises, there's smells, there's kids, there's balls, there's just all sorts of things going on. And to protect the dogs, we don't want kids running, you know, doggy, because it's not a pet, it's doing a job, it's providing a service. Um, but also for as calm as that dog was in that type of environment, you knew, you knew that that's, was, that's how he was trained. Um, that's what he was trained to do. And he was doing his job. He was on duty. And, you know, um, we see, I feel like we're seeing more and more uh, service animals, dogs out in public. Um, it just makes me sad to know that there are people out there that can and do take advantage of it because that's not fair to those that, that need it. But, Again, when the dog comes in and starts acting up and jumping up and down and barking and piddling everywhere, okay, we're going to have to ask you to leave because this is not how you act. Let's take a break. We come back, we got some more comparisons of federal and state fair housing. Let's take 10.
All right. Go back. So we're going to take attendance. And what we're doing now is comparing fair housing. I have taken attendance. So if you're just coming back, please let me know. Um, we're comparing fair housing to state and again, any, you know, again, put real estate aside, put fair housing aside. Anytime you have a conflict of law, the stricter of the two will prevail. So in this case, in North Carolina, federal allows discriminate or exemptions um, when the home is owned by, not owned by three or more. State level says FISBO and FERBO are not exempt. And I've taken attendance, so make sure I know you're here. Um, another distinction between the two, we said earlier, federal allows rental exemption only if the owner lives in a unit, so owner occupied. State allows rental exemption if the owner or a family member. So if you want to buy a fourplex for your kid to go to school, you're not going to live there, but you're going to let your kid live there. State does allow um, the family member again. If this winds up in court, the stricter of the two is going to prevail. So in this case, federal, uh, federal is going to win out. State's less restrictive, so federal is more, and it'll win out. Thank you. Another thing that state housing allows for that fair housing does not mention um, state law also has an exemption for a single sex dormitory. So um, college rooms, for example. State law exempts single sex dormitories. We're starting to see, well, not starting to, but you got like, for example, co-ed dorms. Have they figured out how to define sex yet? I'm sorry. Well, it's, you know, sex is that protected class. Yep. So you can have the same sex, but have they figured out how to define what that means yet? There, you know, I haven't heard them weigh in on that. Yep. Yeah. But remember, sexual orientation and gender identity. So yes, they have figured out sexual orientation and gender identity uh, are now covered under federal fair housing. Don't know where state stands on that. Federal fair housing is enforced by HUD. State fair housing is enforced by the North Carolina Human Relations Commission. Again, the complainant has up to a year to file a complaint. So if you feel, or if you're a buyer or seller or landlord or tenant, you feel that they were discriminated against because of one of the protected classes, they have a year. Whether or not they start at state or start at federal, you know, that's right. So I, I'm sorry. I asked you guys to cross that out. Let's go back to page page 477. The book does say does not protect. The law has changed since then. So make sure you cross that out. Everybody see that on page 477 where it says sex, male or female gender. And then in parentheses, it says does not protect sexual orientation or gender identity. 477, cross that out. Uh, the best place, um, if, 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 the end of, if the complainant doesn't know where to start, do I start with the state level or the federal level? Uh, our best advice to them might be to contact an attorney and have an attorney determine which direction, which route they should go. So federal fair housing, North Carolina state fair housing. And then over on page 484, 
we start talking about some prohibited practices, things not allowed. One thing not allowed is called block busting. Block busting is also known as panic peddling. Block busting is about the owners. Y'all write that down. Sellers and landlords. Block busting is about the owners. The idea of block busting is the act of encouraging people to sell or rent their homes by claiming that the entry of a protected class is moving into the neighborhood. We cannot encourage people to sell by claiming the entry of a protected class into the neighborhood. No matter how subtle that message may be, you're implying that you need to sell or rent. And that's a prohibited practice. It's not allowed. Blockbusting is about the owners. Blockbusting is about the owners. Steering is about buyers and tenants. Write that down. Blockbusting is about the owners. Steering is about buyers and tenants. Steering is also known as channeling. We can't channel, we can't steer buyers and tenants to or away from a certain area due to members of protected class. We can't encourage people into or discourage them away from a neighborhood. Discrimination in advertising is always a prohibited practice. Again, your language, talk about the property, talk about the neighborhood, talk about the amenities nearby. Don't talk about the people. Steering is about the buyers and the tenants. Redlining is more, it used to be a lender practice. It just blows my mind this used to be a thing. It's not anymore. It's prohibited now. But once upon a time ago, there were some lenders out there. And they would go and they would put a big map on the wall of the city. And they would actually take their red marker and they would walk up to the map. And they say, we're not going to originate a loan here, here or here and they would actually circle neighborhoods on the map that they were not going to originate the loan redlining not allowed today today if you're denied a loan it better be because your debt to income ratio doesn't work out or the home doesn't qualify under fha or va it has nothing to do with the neighborhood So redlining is refusing to make a mortgage loan because a property of where a property is located. North Carolina also has some laws protecting tenants and sexual harassment situations. Uh, tenants shouldn't be in or under any kind of uh, stress or situation where the landlord is um, requesting or demanding or implying anything of a sexual harassment behavior. This includes verbal, um, suggestive comments, jokes, insults, nonverbal would be uh, whistling, obscene gestures. Physical would be inappropriate touching. Tenants are protected from sexual harassment from their landlord. There's another good chart in your book. I say good, but it's already updated since your book. I mean, it's just it, it's just constantly evolving. This is what I need you guys to understand. As our culture changes, as our society changes, so does fair housing. So, for example, if you look in your book on page 486, 
HUD's got some advertising guidelines. And by the way, HUD's advertising guidelines are like 40 some pages long. So they have words that uh, should not be used in advertising. You guys will cover all that. Um, but under race, color, national origin, uh, you see where it says permitted master bedroom. A lot of MLSs are now doing away with master bedroom. We're starting to replace these with primary bedroom, uh, owner's suite. So even as we speak, even as, as this book was published, some of these things are changed. And I think this is good because it shows us that this stuff is constantly evolving, constantly changing. Uh, Triad MLS, we now have a primary bedroom category. Uh, Charlotte's the same way. And I imagine other MLSs. So these are just here for examples, obviously. But like I said, they have, it's a 40 some page document of words that can't be used. Uh, when we get into license law and commission rule next week, we're gonna learn that the broker in charge is responsible for advertising, anything that goes out under the firm's name. And one thing that the broker in charge is responsible for making sure is that no uh, discriminatory language So let's bring all this home. What's this mean for us? We can be found guilty of discrimination even if there was no intent. I think this is about the most important thing I have to say. We can be found guilty even if there was no intent. Please always remember what we do for one, we do for all. So even if you don't intend, but you accidentally treat somebody differently, it could be seen, it could be interpreted as a discriminatory act. Let's say, for example, I'm doing an open house on Sunday and I have my open house registry in the, cook, in the kitchen next to a plate of nice warm cookies. And I tell everybody that comes into my open house, sign my registry, take a cookie. What I do for one, I have to do for all, right? So every single person that walks in the front door of my open house, I should be told to sign my registry and take a cookie. Well, what if I'm busy and somebody comes in and I don't get to tell them that and then they hear me say that to somebody else. Could they claim that I discriminate against them? Could they claim that because of a member of the protected class, I didn't want them to sign my registry. I didn't want them to take a cookie. And that's what we're, this is what we're drawing you to. I, I didn't mean to, I was busy. I was doing something else. Fair housing says, guess what? We can be found guilty of discrimination even if there was no intent. What you do for one, you've got to do for all. And I think that's the absolute best policy. It's good for you, right? Because you got your policy down place. You know what you say when people come into your open house, but it also protects you. Uh, we mentioned HUD's advertising. Again, constantly changing. Um, Tried MLS came out with a really nice software the first the first of last year we've had it for over a year now and tried mls will flag words that might be a discriminatory purpose they're not saying don't use it they're just saying whoa 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 make sure you're using this appropriately so for example this came out last january in like february or march i was putting a listing in for one of our builders and in the remarks we were talking about the white cabinets in the kitchen and mls flagged me they didn't tell me I couldn't use that. They just said, warning, make sure you're using the word white appropriately. And in this case, I was using it to describe a thing, not a person. So I knew it was okay. But it's a nice touch because if you inadvertently use a word that's on some of that 40 page list, they're gonna flag it and just say, proceed with caution. But when I first saw that yellow, it's like the yellow triangle with the explanation point in it. You know, that thing popped up on my screen. I was like, what did I do? But they were just warning me, make sure you're using that word appropriately. Also for us, 
Uh, National Association of Realtors says we should have a sign saying discrimination is against company policy. Uh, we looked at that um, equal opportunity housing poster. NAR considers that acceptable. And remember, our written agency agreement musts, and one of the musts in our written agency agreements is that we have the non-discrimination clause. Uh, we'll go back and look at, we'll pick, pick a random one, listing or buyer. We'll go back and look at that uh, again in just a minute. But our listing agreement has the non-discrimination clause, our buyer's agency agreement, uh, property management, all of our agency agreements must contain the non-discrimination clause. Some good, again, the in practice on page 489, this unit's got some really good stuff in it. So make sure uh, you guys are looking at this, but there's some situations, some response, just to help you guys, get you guys thinking about these things. Our nice side-by-side -side comparison, American Disability Act. This is about public accommodations, fair housing is for housing for the dwelling. ADA picks up once you walk outside the front door, public accommodations. Um, some property managers have to buy by both. You have those large apartment complexes, for example. I had a lady in pre-licensing night class a couple of years ago, and she was, uh, administrative assistant for apartment complex. I think she said they had like 200 units. And in some days, the poor thing just came in frazzled, especially around the first of the month. You know, she just came in frazzled. And she shared with us that ADA and fair housing would have secret shoppers. They would send secret shoppers. They would have people come by. They would have people call and ask questions and see how they responded. She said they did it all the time to make sure that they were responding appropriately. Now, if you didn't, they would just say, you know, better get some training, better get some more knowledge. If it happened again and again and again, then they might start investigating and looking into it further. But for any place with it, now if you're talking about, a, if you're renting a single family home, for example, property manager, you don't have public accommodations. So when we talk about public accommodations, we're talking about common areas, generally multifamily. But it's really important that we see ADA is about the public accommodations, fair housing is about the dwelling. ADA picks up where fair housing leaves off. We talked about this earlier. You guys also have this in your unit 15 notes, but this is our lenders protected classes equal credit opportunity act credit. And that is that we're talking about a lender. So we saw this in 19. Again, their protected classes are similar, race, color, religion, national origin, and sex. Obviously familiar status is not protected. What is protected in equal credit opportunity that we don't have in fair housing is age. Age implies that the applicant is 18 because somebody that's not 18 can't get a home loan. So the children aren't protected in the mortgage world, but age is. So in other words, if a 90 year old calls movement mortgage to apply for a 30 year mortgage loan, they cannot be denied that loan because of their age. As long as their income to debt ratio works out, uh, marital status, is covered under Equal Credit Opportunity Act. We don't see that in fair housing. And then also protected under Equal Credit Opportunity Act 
is recipients of public assistance. Again, we don't see that in fair housing. So the last little piece of this unit is talking about professional uh, ethics, professional standards. And one thing that we have as realtors is a code of ethics. So to become a realtor, you first have to get your license. Once you affiliate with your firm, you may or may not have the option to join the National Association of Realtors. Joining the National Association of Realtors makes you a realtor. I'm going to make sure I say this right. Give me a second. All realtors are brokers, but not all brokers are realtors. Did I do that right? All realtors are brokers, but not all brokers are realtors. It's a separate, it's a separate membership level. You get your license, you become a broker. You want to take that a step further, become a realtor. Once you become a realtor, you're bound to the National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics. They have 16 articles. You will get your code of ethics training and your new agent onboarding when you join your firm and you join your local board of realtors. The local board of realtors will give you your code of ethics training that go over the 16 articles. NAR requires us to do code of ethics training. Currently, it's every three years. The good news is code of ethics also counts for some of your CE credit, your continuing education credit. So you can roll the two into one. They used to say four years. We had to do, we had to do code, uh, code of ethics every four years. And then they came in and said, that's not enough. Let's do two. And then they said, no, no, that's too much. So I guess the Goldilocks is three. So that's why I say currently. We're doing code of ethics training every three years. It's a good opportunity to review not only the 16 articles, but also the other um, pieces from NAR that make them NAR. If you don't join NAR, if you just remain a broker and you choose not to be a realtor, if your firm allows, I never fear because a lot of our commission rules, North Carolina Real Estate Commission rules, are also very applicable to the code of ethics. So you're not gonna get away with not following the code of ethics because you don't join National Association of Realtors. Some firms will make you join, some firms may give you the option, all firms are different. Questions? So for unit 19, again, you guys, the key terms, make sure we know what those words mean. Key point review, it's on page 492. And then your student quiz on 494. So let's go out. Hey, Julie. Yeah. Oh, is it time for a break? No, right? No. no. Okay, sorry. I saw the clock, the timer. I have a question. There's an example in um, on page 480, and it's with regards to familial status. And I was just wondering how you would um, handle such a situation. What page? I'm sorry. 480, 480. For page 480. Um, let's see. What is your, what is it's your, one with Greg? Greg? Uh -huh. yes. 
So Greg owns an apartment. His elderly tenant, Paul, was terminally ill. Paul requests that no children be allowed in the vacant apartment next door because the noise would be difficult. Greg agreed. Unfortunately, Greg went wrong and refused to deny the families because those kids, that familiar status is the protected class. Mm. Um, even though Greg only wanted to make things easier, he nonetheless found to have violated fair housing because of the familiar status. So again, and that's that's a great question. And I think that's a lot of the questions. I mean, we just introduced you guys to fair housing, right? Just scratching surfaces here. And I think that's a very common question. And that's where fair housing is very clear, where they say, guys, these are our rules. You don't have to defend it, but you just have to make sure that you let them know that this is what we say. So in other words, we're kind of playing the middleman. So you may like it or not, right? Like this poor neighbor, and I agree, you know, this poor neighbor, but Greg just needs to look at him and say, I, you know, my hands are tied here. Fair housing mm -hmm. says I cannot discriminate. I cannot deny kids moving in next door. Now, maybe we can talk to them. You know, what are your sleeping hours? You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, maybe mm -hmm. we can be mm -hmm. and work together, but they can't be denied because the neighbor doesn't want the kids. And fair housing is pretty clear, I think, that they say, this is on us. And we have no problem with you saying, this isn't my rule. This isn't my firm's rule. Mm -hmm. This is real estate commission. This isn't the association of realtors. This is fair housing. And the people, I mean, you know, we got a phenomenal tool at our fingertips these days called Google. So the people could, you know, do their own research, investigate themselves. Um, we always say that a big part of our job is educating the public. And I think when it comes to fair housing, especially situations like that, I think that's a big part of our job is helping to educate the public. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Guys, I, I, I'm not going to lie. You're going to have... You're going to be working with buyers and sellers. I, I've several sellers in my career have looked at me and said, I don't want to sell my home to fill in the blank. And that's an uncomfortable situation. I'm not going to lie. That's an uncomfortable situation. First off, why the heck do they care who they're selling the home to as long as they can afford it? I never understood that. But we just have to, we can't put our head in the sand and run away from it. When that comes up, we need to hit it head on and say, fair housing doesn't allow us to discriminate against that protected class. If the buyer's qualified and they have an offer, then we're going to consider that offer. And if they refuse and refuse and refuse, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to work with that seller. If we can't get them to get past that, and your firm will probably back you on that because not only are you protecting yourself, but you're protecting them as well. So there's going to be some uncomfortable conversations out there. And again, fair housing says, this is our rule. This isn't yours. You don't have to defend it. This is ours. And it is what it is. I had buyers once he was coming from out of town and, and uh, his dad, <laughs> His dad came with us. Buyer's dads are the best. I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys that right now. Buyer's dads, wonderful. Y'all going to love them. So, so dad came with us. And we went to the first house and we walked up on the porch and I'm opening the door and dad says, so tell me about the neighbors. And I'm like, that's a weird question because I don't, you know, I don't sound like I went and introduced myself to all the neighbors before I showed the house. You know, I said, I don't know. So I, I said, oh, you know. This is the neighborhood. And, you know, I didn't know where he was going. So then the second house, we walked out the door. What about these neighbors? And I'm like, where is this guy going? And finally, the, the son, he said, Dad, she doesn't know. She doesn't know the neighbors. And I was like, thank you. I'm still not exactly sure where he was, what he was wanting to know about the neighbors. But quite frankly, if it's, you know, various report, you know, if it's a, um, what do they call it? I just lost it. The thing they do every 10 years, the census. If it, you know, census report, they could find that information. Um, your dad did. <laughs> That's awesome. Dad's that buyer's dads are the best. I cannot wait for y'all to deal with a buyer's dad. I cannot. They're a good time. But you, you know, it, it, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't address it because I didn't really know what he was getting at. And and you know, maybe I, but but son interfered and jumped in and squashed that. It never happened again. But. Um, you, you know, I guess in hindsight, 
I could have asked some questions and tried to direct a little bit better, but I just wasn't really sure where we were going. But yeah, I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't know the neighborhoods. Nosy neighbors, you meet those at open house. They like to come to open houses. Yep. <laughs> so let's look at a few things we have in the online learning system for you guys for unit 19. There's some good stuff in here. Uh, first off, in the Unit 19 material, Real Estate Commission has provided us with one of their Q&A brochures. Uh, this is a great publication. Um, I think it's worth you guys looking over again, trying to wrap your, your brains around all this, not just for your exam. The other thing I have in here for you is some case studies, some actual scenarios. Um, I think the scenario, the application, well, we know your test is an application test. So these case studies, these scenarios may help you um, better interpret some of these scenarios. I do, I've also included the explanation. So you read the scenario case study one, and then it tells you what the answer is and then, you know, why. If you're thinking to yourself, these scenarios look like Julie copied from a book and put them on the online learning system, you would be absolutely correct. And specifically the book where I got it from is the North Carolina Real Estate Manual. This is the thing you guys get to use in post licensing. It's a good book. It's about the size of your pre-licensing book. The good news is, is one manual gets you through all three post licensing classes. So you don't have to get three of these, you know, just one for all of post. But there's a whole chapter dedicated to fair housing in the manual. And the commission has provided us in post licensing with these case studies and the scenarios. So again, I think just the application of them, the it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. You know what I'm saying? Like you read the scenario and then you decide A, B, C, or D, um, and then go check out the explanation as to why the, the right answer. Um, I mentioned the other day that NAR recognizes April as fair housing month. Um, and they put out a lot of good stuff then too. They put out a, um, it's like a simulation. Um, a fi you are the agent of a fictitious town called Fairhaven, I think. And they walk you through several scenarios of working with people in Fairhaven to help you buy and sell. And again, it's like a choose your own adventure. And, you know, you select your answer and they tell you you did right or wrong and why, you know, so um, I can't get you guys into that. You got to be a member of NAR and I'm not giving you my login and password. So once you get into NAR, you can, you know, be the broker of Fairhaven and kind of go through that simulation as well. Um, be prepared in April in your firms to have, have good training. NAR is always releasing, releasing good stuff. The other thing I have in here for you guys, this is from CE. Um, 2020, 2021 CE. Um, again, fair housing pops up in CE every once in a while. And this is like a 24 page document. So I do not want you to read this whole thing. But the reason I put it in here is because they have these scenarios again. So they give us some scenarios and then you have to go to the end to find the solutions. But I, you know, I, I think the scenarios, the real life situations really help bring this stuff home instead of reading unit 19 over and over and over again. So I've given you guys lots of these case studies, these scenarios um, to help you better understand that. Questions, comments? We were going to go, see, I almost forgot. So let's go back up to unit eight really quick. And I see our listing agreement first. So this is the one we're going to pick on. All of our written agency agreements must contain the non-discrimination clause. So the agent firm shall conduct all brokerage activities in regard to this agreement without respect to the race, color, religion, sex, national origin, handicap, or familiar status of any party or prospective party. 
Further, realtors have an ethical duty to conduct such activities without respect to sexual orientation or gender identity of any party or prospective party. So we see this in our listing agreement, our buyer's agency agreement, and our property management agreement. All agency agreements. Questions, comments? You want to take a big deep breath with me? In through the nose, out through the mouth. You ready? Unit 18. This is our account unit. Let's put on our accountant hat. We talk about federal income taxation of real property ownership. A couple tax benefits. The theme of this unit is call your accountant. This is one of these units is teaching you guys just enough to be dangerous. But bottom line, unless you're a CPA or you're an accountant current on the law, you cannot be giving accounting advice. So if your buyers or sellers have questions about their taxes, what is a write-off, what's not, we need to make sure they contact their accountant. So our roadmap, we're gonna identify some tax benefits of home ownership. We're gonna talk about some itemized deductions. This is the last time y'all are gonna see calculate from me. Is this good news? And really it's not even math calculations. We just got some formulas to go over. This is our last map. I expected a better reaction. <laughs> We've covered the map. So there's two different types of tax benefits that this unit uh, goes over. And the first is tax benefits for owners. So if you own a personal residence, you may be eligible for some tax benefits some tax deductions. Uh, things that you may be able to write off. Your mortgage interest, remember your PITI? Whatever you pay in that first I might be a tax deductible expense. Your discount points, remember discount points are just prepaid interest. So the year you buy your home, you have mortgage interest that you're sending in once a month, but if you bought any discount points, the year you bought your home, you may be eligible for those as a tax deduction. If you have to pay a prepayment penalty, that might be tax deductible. Mortgage insurance premium, NIP for an FHA loan. And then maybe even your loan origination fees. I think what we're getting from this slide is the year you buy a home or the year your buyer buys a home, have them talk to their accountant, make sure all those, any of those closing expenses can be a write-off. The other thing that owners of a personal residence may be able to write off are their taxes each year. So if this come to you with a lot of questions about what's deductible, again, is anybody on this call CPA? No. Is anybody on this call current with the tax laws? Exactly. So all of you are telling your buyers and sellers, even if you do your own taxes on TurboTax, you don't know. You don't know. So have them call your accountant, your, their accountant. The tax benefit for homeowners' personal residence is one place for tax deductions. The other place for tax deductions is when you sell. So once you sell your property. So we're gonna define these words. Later, we're gonna put them in a formula. Some of us see the definition, some of us see the map. So we're giving you a couple of different options here. Capital gain is the amount realized from the sale of your property. So when you sell your home, 
your amount realized is your capital gain. Your cost basis is your initial cost. What did you pay for the property? Cost basis is your initial cost. Capital improvements is anything you did to it to add value while you owned it. We talked about capital improvements last night. You can't paint a room and say you added value. You add a value by, basically the best way to add value is to add square foot. You're gonna finish the unfinished basement. You're gonna add on, you're gonna build a room on the back of your house. That's gonna give you a capital improvement. So cost basis looks at what you paid for it. Capital improvements looks at what you did while you owned it. Your adjusted basis is your cost basis plus your capital improvements. So your adjusted basis right here is your cost basis. What did you pay for it? Plus your capital improvements. Your amount realized is what did you sell it for? Cost basis is what you bought it for. Amount realized is what you sold it for. The difference in the two should give you your capital gain. Again, we're gonna put all these words in a formula in just a second. That's the math. We're never gonna pick a calculator up. Is that good news? Last piece of math doesn't require calculator, just formulas. When selling real property, there are certain considerations, whether you've owned the property long-term or short-term. Short-term is defined as 12 months or less. You're not gonna have tax considerations for capital gains if you are a short-term owner. Who's the short-term owner? Typically, who is the short-term owner? I see your mouths move. <laughs> the flipper, the investor. So their tax benefits come from them doing their job, right? That's their job is to buy a house, flip it, and turn around and sell it. That's where they get their tax benefits. So these tax benefits that we're referring to when selling are for long-term ownership, which is going to be 12 months or more, more than 12 months. Short-term isn't eligible for capital gains. So selling real property, if you're selling your real property and it's your principal residence, if you're a married couple filing jointly, you may be eligible for up to $500,000 tax-free. I'll explain that more in just one second. If you're single or you're married filing separately, you may be eligible for up to $250,000 tax-free. Again, we'll put this all together in just one second. The other thing that they need to consider with selling your real property that's your personal residence is how long you live there. Um, you've had to occupy the home for two out of the last five years. Those two years don't have to be consecutive, but the time you live there in the last five years needs to add up to two years. So some of those words we just defined um, are all going to help us lead to determine our capital gains. Uh, the purchase price is our cost basis. So our cost basis are our purchase price plus our allowable closing costs. Add to that our capital gains, purchase price plus cost basis. I'm sorry, no, 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 no. Purchase price. Here, let's do it that way. My arrows don't work. Purchase price and capital improvements. That gives us our cost basis. Purchase price plus capital improvements is your cat is your uh, cost basis. You can add in your allowable closing costs. Again, your your purchase price and your allowable closing costs are back in the day when you bought it. 
add to it any capital gains you made over the years. That gives you your adjusted basis. Building our formula to solve for capital gains, we first have to find the adjusted basis. Then fast forward to when you sell it. Adjusted basis is when you bought it while you owned it. Now, when you sell it, you take your sales price minus your allowable closing costs. That gives you your amount realized. How amount did you realize? So sales price, what you sold it for. Minus your allowable closing costs is your amount realized. And then the difference of the two is going to give you your capital gain. If it's a negative number, if you didn't have a gain, you had a loss. So first we have to look at, again, what do we buy for it? What do we buy it for? What capital improvements did I make? Compare that to what I sold it for. My amount realized, the difference in what I sold it for versus what I bought it for. I would know what the words mean. I would know the formulas. I would not worry about having to do any math with these. So put your pencils down for a second. Let's, let's put this together. To my math people in here, let's put this together. Let's say, for example, you had a purchase price. You bought it for $398 and you had $1,500 in closing costs. Uh, 20 years later, you sold it for $920 and you had $600 in closing costs. So your purchase price plus your closing costs gave you your cost basis. Uh, had you had capital improvements, you would add that to your cost basis and have your um, adjusted basis. Fast forward, you sold it for 920 minus your allowable closing costs, and that gave you your amount realized. The difference of the two gave you a capital gain of $519,850. Now that we know that number, if you were a married couple filing jointly, your capital gains of 519,850, you would have a $500,000 tax deduct exemption, which would give you $19,850 of taxable capital gain. You wanna pay taxes on 19,000 or 519,000? It's huge, isn't it? That's what that 500 and that 250, that's where that comes into play. So now, again, the rate varies. I'm not an accountant, but presumably this year, the tax rate's 15%. So now your tax bill is only $2,977.50 versus whatever 15% of 519,850. So that's where that capital gains. That's where those formulas, again, that 500 for married filing jointly, 250 for single filing or single or married filing separately. Questions? We're done with math. All right, let's go celebrate and take a break. Come back in 10, <laughs> gonna wrap up uh, 18 and get going on 16.
Welcome back. Let me take attendance. And so we go through the capital gains, we define the words, uh, and we put them in a formula. So again, just having an understanding of what that means, however you see it best, having an understanding. Other tax rules, I guess, if you will, special rules, things to consider, things you may be asked about, things you may be inquiring about yourself. Um, there could be some special rules, some benefits for office in the home. We've seen this grow in the last, well, almost three years, haven't we? So a lot of people now have a home office. Um, that space may be tax write-off, tax deductible. There are some restrictions, of course, um, but if you have a home office, that could be something to consider talking to your accountant about you guys see my write off you see this corner of my home <laughs> this is my office this is it there is no fun that happens back here whatsoever it's all work uh so this is my this is my tax write off installment sales remember we talked about installment land contracts in unit 10 um the buyer is buying the home they're not doing it on one full price they're doing it in installments so the seller's collecting installment payments. That might be uh, some thing for them to mention to their accountant. Maybe there's some deductions there. Uh, one of those parties is paying taxes. May that be the buyer or the seller. So there's some tax considerations there as, as well. And then if you have a vacation home, you might be able to write off certain expenses revolved around the home too. Again, there's rules involved. Uh, I think for the vacation home, for example, it's not eligible if you are there more than 14 days out of the year. It is solely for other people to vacation. So you only get to enjoy your own home for, <laughs> for a couple for 14 days if you want the tax write-offs. Again, get with your accountant. Always get with your accountant. Another thing that we want may want to consider um, an investor's tool is the tax deferred exchange, also known as the 1031. This applies to investors. And what this does, the IRS allows an investor to sell one investment property, use the proceeds of that sale to purchase another investment property, and not have to pay taxes on the sale. So as long as the investor is investing, as long as they sell this home, use this money to buy another, another investment property, they may be able to defer paying their taxes. There's no end to this until they stop becoming an investor. When we talk about like kind exchange, it's property for property. So it's not like we're looking for townhome for townhome or something like that. It's property for property. So this is a nice investor tool. Allow them to take advantage uh, of that if they're aware of it. If you work with investors, I would make sure that, or if you are an investor, I would make sure you talk to your accountant about this program. There's some rules. Uh, I remember my teammate did one of these with a seller a couple of years ago. And um, I want to say he had to buy the next investment property within like six months. So for example, so there's again, some rules, um, but it's definitely, if you're an investor and you're gonna sell one property to buy another, absolutely worth talking to an accountant and seeing what kind of benefits you might be able to get there. Okay, so you got to find it within so long and then close within six. So you can't drag your feet, can you, as an investor? Um, especially, I mean, the market conditions might dictate this, right? You know, the last couple of years, it's been hard to buy a home. So investors may not have been able to, to get in within that six months.
Another accountant tool is depreciation. Determining how much value the property is lost. Um, accountants, as with investors, like to use straight line depreciation. We look at that when we we're talking about our income capitalization approach. Straight line depreciation says it depreciates the same amount each year. So, for example, it depreciates $30,000 on year one, $30,000 on year two, $30,000 on year five. It depreciates the same amount every year for its economic life. Again, these are investors. You can't claim depreciation on your principal residence. And when I said unit 18 was short and sweet, I was not kidding. Did you guys see a lot of green stars in unit 18? Expect a question or two, nothing crazy. Key terms on page 463, key point review on 472, and then your student quiz on 473. And don't forget your student quiz, um, what page is that page? 474, there's those three questions from our investor's math that we were looking at last night, unit 12. So there is some helpful stuff there. Normally at this point in the unit, I stop and ask if there's any questions, but I'm gonna tell you guys, y'all literally know what I know when it comes to tax benefits and gains and accounting and all that stuff. So you're welcome to ask questions. But if it's not the book, well, I won't. <laughs> There's my disclosure. Do I have any questions? I do not want to dismiss you guys. Do we have any questions? good the last thing i will say guys please remember going into real estate going in as a broker you're an independent contractor if you've never been an independent contractor before you're 1099 they don't withhold taxes from your commission check but also as an independent contractor there are things that are write-offs in your business expense so your first year in real estate sales i highly recommend that you guys talk to an accountant to make sure you're taking advantage of everything that you can. Questions? All right, unit 16. Which is another green star unit? Question or two, nothing crazy. This is a good one. I like this one. This is some basic residential construction. Please note the word basic. We're not in builder school. We're not looking at commercial construction. Commercial properties tend to be built differently. This unit's focus is on residential. So we're scratching the surface. Giving us this basic understanding of how houses are built because buyers ask. Buyers do ask questions. So our roadmap, we're going to describe some basic architectural types and styles. And then we're gonna identify just some basic components of the home, of the house and the foundation, the framing, et cetera. So let's talk about some architectural styles first. Well, first off, before we do that, let's say first that most homes in North Carolina, most homes, are wood framed construction. So lumber, most residential. Um, wood is used um, for flexibility, for design, costs. Wood is a very popular product to build homes. Who else likes wood? 
those little pesky buggers, termites. So the wood used to build home is generally pre-treated. Hopefully, if not, you may still want to talk to Terminex. <laughs> Can't hurt. Couple of different styles. Obviously, this isn't all of them, but this just kind of gives us an idea of some styles. The ranch style, all the main living is on one level. So you're going to have the living room, dining room, kitchen, bedrooms, bathrooms, everything's on the one level. Maybe you have a basement, but all ranch is, is going to be every, all the main living on one level. Split level, you have your garage here, and then you have typically this, this main level here is going to be um, living room, maybe dining room, kitchen, living quarters. And then about halfway through the home, you split and stairs go up and down. Uh, typically on the second floor here, you're going to have your bedrooms. And then usually in the bottom there, your basement area, you might have um, a bonus room, a family room, a den, for example. Don't confuse a split level with a split foyer. A split foyer is a two-story house. You walk in the front door, you got two choices. You go up or you go down. The split level versus a split foyer. Uh, Two-story homes generally have living room, kitchen, dining room on the main level. Uh, most bedrooms are upstairs. The primary on the main is becoming a more popular option. The, the, the owner's suite. Owners don't want stairs, apparently. We'll let the kids go live upstairs and we'll stay down here on the first floor. <laughs> Um, so typically you might see a primary on the main, if not all your bedrooms, maybe a loft upstairs, big family area. And then contemporary is more about the architectural design, the unique design. I always picture the Jetsons living in that house for some reason, just kind of a more unique, um, different kind of style. So why don't you guys, let me ask you guys a question for the private chat. Based on these four styles, which one, private chat, which one do you think is the most expensive to build? Which one do you think is the most expensive to build? Yeah, per square foot. Most expensive to build. A lot of you are saying contemporary, and I agree those can get expenses, especially when you get particular. But typically, and I, I, I guess I didn't clarify that, I apologize. But typically, per square foot, the most expensive to build is the ranch because the two most expensive components to build are the roof and the foundation. And with the ranch, everything's on the foundation, everything's under one roof. The two story might be the same square foot as the ranch, but it only uses half of the foundation and half of the, half of the roof. Um, I do agree with you guys, contemporary could get really expensive really fast for sure. But if we're talking about per square foot, your roof and your foundation are usually the most expensive. So what we're going to do, talk about some different building terms. Why don't you guys take a screenshot of this real quick or a picture real quick. We're actually going to break this down into sections. But this just kind of gives you the big picture. So with these terms, as with builders, builders start at the bottom and work the Start at the bottom and work their way up, right? So we too are gonna to start at the bottom. And it all starts with the foundation. Another foundation, the very first thing we're gonna put down are the footings. Footings are poured concrete. We're gonna dig out some trenches, put in some footings. They need to be below the frost line to allow for expansion. 
you go to different parts of the country, the frost line may be further down than other parts. So usually concrete below the soil line. Footings are the lowest part of construction. Where's your foot? Your foot is the lowest part of you, right? So footings are the lowest part of constructions. On the footings go our foundation. We got a couple of different types of foundations. We'll see those next. But the foundations again are generally concrete, maybe brick. They rest on the footings. If you have an open, like a crawl space, for example, or a basement, you might have piers. You guys see these piers here. This just helps to offer support. We don't want sagging floors. So the piers just help offer support, give the weight of the home. Types of foundations that we usually see, uh, the crawl space lifts the living area above the ground. It allows for ventilation, moisture control. A basement is a story high crawl space. Again, it lifts the main level, the living space off the ground. Maybe the basement is finished, maybe it's not. And then with the slab foundation, they just pour down, pour concrete, even it out. And there's your slab foundation. A basement is a story high crawl space. Um, buyers generally have preferences. Some buyers, sure, buyers want a foundation, some want a slab. Um, one possible negative to a slab, they put the plumbing in and the pipes and, the, and everything, and then they pour that concrete down. So those pipes are where they are. So if you want to remodel your bathroom, your sink is here. At least with a foundation or a crawl space or a basement, you can get under there and move stuff around if you really wanted to. If you're not looking to do major renovations, then a slab uh, may not be a terrible option for you. Again, it just comes down to buyer's preferences. So building up from the foundation, uh, we got the, let's see, here's our footing, our foundation wall. On our foundation wall is our sill. Our sill is our lowest horizontal piece. It sits on the foundation. Girders may be on the sill to even things out balance things out, maybe offer support. So the girder. On the sill or the girder is our floor joist. The floor joist supports the entire weight of the floor. It helps form the structure of the floor. On top of our floor joist goes our subfloor. Subfloor is usually plywood or pressed wood. What we walk on goes on our subfloor. So our carpet, laminate, tile. You guys ever pulled up carpet? Interested to see what's under there? There's some interesting things under that carpet, isn't there? Pull up tile. There's some interesting things going on down there. Sole plates connect, we're gonna see this next, but they connect what we're looking at here as part of a stud. So the sole plate connects the subfloor to the stud. So if we go up now, we can see the stud. Again, you got your sole plate that connects the floor, your top plate that connects the ceiling, <clears throat> and that's what holds the, the stud together. 
Think of the sole of your shoes. Sole of your shoes is the bottom versus the top plate. Studs are your vertical lumber. Studs are, are the bones. Studs are what gives the home its shape, its structure. Today's building code says most of the time studs are 16 inches apart. You find an older home, that might be different. So the sole plate connects the stub to the stud floor. The top plate connects the stud to the ceiling joist. We'll get up to the roof in just a second. Headers are vertical pieces of wood that go over openings to offer supports. Those think like openings for a door or a window. We don't want that door falling in on us, right? So a header, I remember this because it prevents the door opening from falling on my head, just to offer support in that opening. Still on studs for a second or your framing. There's a couple different types of framing systems. The most common, what you're looking at right here is the platform. With the platform, each floor is framed separately. So you see, I got two different floors. This floor has it, whoops, sorry. This floor has its wood and then the second floor has its wood. In a balloon, the studs go from the foundation to the ceiling. If this was a balloon framing, this would be one really long piece of wood that went the whole way from top to bottom. Post and beam framing system uses a different lumber. These are usually bigger um, than our 16 inch. With post and beam, I always think of Thomas Kincaid homes or um, uh, uh, mountain lodges or something. You see those post and beams. So moving up to the roof and the ceiling, we got our top plate connects the stud to the ceiling joist. Ceiling joist is what supports the weight of the roof. Weight in a home is distributed throughout. We just don't let one thing support the whole weight. We all help each other. The rafters are the sloping members of your roof, the two that come together and give it its, its shape. Your ridge board is your highest point of construction. The flashing is what seals the opening in a roof. So for example, we have a chimney, uh, maybe you have an opening for a vent pipe or something, you're gonna have flashing around it. So water doesn't get in, elements don't get in. Your eave is the overhang of the roof. A big part of the eave is to flow water away from the home. That's a big part of construction, residential construction. Water and wood don't go real good together, do they? So a big part is keeping water away from the home, directing it away from the home. The components of the eave, you have the soffit, which is this piece right here. It's usually ventilated, so it allows for, for air, keep things dry. If you walk outside and you stand with your back right against your house and you look straight up, you'll be looking at the soffit. The fascia board is what we attach our gutters to. Again, gutters help direct water away from the house. 
when it rains, we don't want the rain to sit on the home. We don't want it to lay by the home. We want to direct it away from the home. So gutters attached to our fascia board. And then your freeze board is this little piece right here, more of a decorative piece, kind of helps give the home its look. But it can also help in, in penetration. We don't want water or elements to get in. Questions on our framing, foundation, walls, roofs. We got our studs, we got our framing. Continuing on, at some point we got to put some walls up. Sheathing is what goes on the outside of the studs. Again, it's usually some kind of particle board or plywood. Our exterior siding goes on the sheathing. So whatever your, is it vinyl, brick, stone? It attaches to the sheathing. It's attached by using tar paper or what we're seeing more common today is house wrap. What you're looking at here is a picture of house wrap. Um, the sheathing has, this house wrap usually has a plastic water barrier, again, help keep things dry. And then on your sheathing goes your exterior siding. More common ones are vinyl, brick, maybe stucco. Exterior siding is what gives the home its look. It's what we see. Homes have windows. We've got a couple different types of windows. Sliding windows, there's a piece that either slides up or back and forth. Either it goes horizontal or vertical. One piece moves. Swinging windows are the ones that open out. They're usually on a crank and you crank them out, crank them back in. Fixed windows don't open. Fixed windows are your picture windows, like what you're looking at here. Good question comes in, does the outside material change its value? For example, um, all siding, versus all brick, um, you know, some people would argue, yes, I think that might come down to a preference thing. I don't honestly know how an appraiser would interpret that. I think brick is gonna withstand the elements better. I think it's gonna last longer. Vinyl's usually cheaper building product. I think that's why we see so much vinyl. I live in a vinyl home. I fell victim to the vinyl. <laughs> Some components of our windows. Your window sill is the bottom, the bottom of the window, the window sill. The window jam or the sides. Then the header is the top. The sash is the panel that moves. 
So if you have a window that opens, whatever part you open, whatever part you move, that's the sash. Muttons and mullions are words I made up to see if you guys are paying attention. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. What, Julie? What? Okay, so <laughs> muttons and mullions are our dividing cross panels of the windows. So the muttons are the horizontal pieces right here. The mullions are the vertical pieces. So the dividing woods, the dividing panels, muttons are horizontal, mullions are vertical. Homes also have doors. Um, your exterior door is going to be different than your interior door. Your exterior door is going to be more solid. It's going to offer more support. Have you ever knocked on your closet door or your bedroom door? It sounds kind of hollow. We don't want that as that being our front door. That wouldn't protect us that much. So your exterior door is more solid, offers more protection. Your interior doors are like your bedroom doors, bathroom doors, closet doors, et cetera. Flush doors are flat, they're smooth. There's no pattern in a flush door. Panel doors, what you're looking at, there's raised indentions. Sliding glass doors, what generally leads us into a patio or a deck. So it's a glass, you open it up. Walk through. And then your French doors are more of your upscale decorative doors, usually have glass panels. Uh, where we see French doors, for example, might be leading from the kitchen to the formal dining room. There might be French doors. The components of the doors are the same as the windows. So the door sill is the bottom, the jam is the sides, the header is the top. Nope, oh, there you go. Questions on windows or doors? Little bit more on our roofing. We got the rafters that give us a shape. On the rafters goes the decking. The decking is again plywood, particle board. They go on the rafters. On our decking goes the uh, shingles. Asphalt shingles are the most common. You might see wood or shape. Shingles are attached to the decking with roofing felt. It's kind of some kind of like tar paper, make it stick. You guys see the shingles in this home and you see how they're all pointed. They're layered as such. This is to draw water down. So when it rains, there's nowhere for it to stick. So it rains, water's gonna run down to the gutters. Hopefully your gutters are clean. The gutters are gonna carry the water away from the home. Again, Water is only good for living things, you guys. Water is not good for your house. The pitch of the roof tells us the slope. It tells us how steep it is. With pitch, we can think of rise over run. The larger the rise, the steeper the roof. There's some, if you look with me on page 428, 
there's some roofing designs. Gable is the most common. Gable is what we see most often. That's your, that's your rafter roof. You may have a hip, which just has four sides instead of the two. Dormers are those decorative little windows. Maybe you can access them, maybe you can't. Salt box, we see, we're starting to see more of these. This is like a story and a half home. So you got the full bottom level and then you got half of the second level. So you might see a salt box roof where it's kind of the triangle on one side, but it's got a big, big, big slope in the back. Uh, your flat roof is generally what we see in commercial. And a lot of times in commercial on the flat roof, there's where your HVAC and AC units are. The key to the flat roof is drainage. We don't want all that rain water to just sit there. We've got to make sure that water goes somewhere. So just to give you an idea, some designs. Like I said, buyers, buyers like to point at stuff and ask questions. And I think dormers are one of those common questions. What's that? Questions on your roof. Homes need some kind of insulation. Uh, various materials, old school, were those bats of insulation, they just kind of rolled out. Today we're seeing some more modern. Uh, the Pink Panther is doing a loose fill. He's blowing in the insulation. Once there, it'll harden. You also may have foam insulation. Again, you kind of spray it in and expands just a bit. It'll harden. Insulation is meant to control heat. It's meant to absorb heat. Definitely want insulation up in the roof because the sun bakes down on the roof all day. We don't necessarily need all that heat in the home fighting our AC unit. Weather stripping is used around exterior doors and windows, help keep the elements out, help keep critters out. And a lot of what we do in the attic, specifically the attic, particularly the attic, uh, for moisture control, um, ventilation is key, crawl space basement as well, ventilation is key, vapor barriers. Vapor barriers look like that. We just saw that in the picture with the crawl space. They look like white trash bags. Crawl space, vapor barrier business is the place to be right now. That's what we should sign up for. Crawl space school. But it keeps things dry. It keeps critters from coming up and it keeps things dry, moisture control. There's different types of insulation. Insulation is listed as an R value. And our North Carolina Uniform Residential Building Code has set certain R values. Um, the higher the R value, the more insulation, the more resilient to heat it is. So in the ceiling, we want a high R value. Again, as the, the, um, or the attic, as the sun beats down on the roof all day, we don't want that heat to get into the home. Obviously you can go higher, your builder can go higher. These are just the minimum requirements per building codes. If you're up in the mountains, it helps insulate 
cold as well. So if you're up in the mountains, you may want a higher R value. Homes need to be heated. AC is a luxury. Typically what we're seeing is an HVAC system which combines heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. HVACs can be electric, they can be gas, solar panels. This is the more um, modern method, HVAC systems. If you find older homes, you may find some other heating systems or maybe just some different types of homes. So for our heating systems, other than HVAC, you might find a central forced warm air. There is no duct system. The heating system is centrally located in the house and the heat just kind of goes everywhere from there. Gravity warm air, again, just has a central furnace. Older homes. Electric baseboards, not as common today. These still might be out there. They run along the, the baseboard of the wall, plug them in, they generate heat. Space heating systems could be um, like wood stoves, kerosene heaters, radiators, those little coil things. Those suckers get hot. And then solar heating systems. Um, we're seeing solar farms pop up. We're seeing solar panels on individual homes. So a solar panel on a home would just be capturing the, the energy, the source from the sun to heat or cool your home. Uh, if, you're, if you see a solar farm, it's collecting that energy, storing it, distributing it throughout its area. My Winston-Salem people, Clemensville Road, kind of across the street from Hobby Park, kind of in between where we Stratford and Ebert or Ebert, depending on where you are in the world. There's a huge solar farm out there. Have you guys seen this thing lately? It is huge. Starting to see those pop up. Again, if it's not an HVAC, we've got a heating system and then we'd have a separate AC system, so that could be a central forced air, no duct work. You may also have room air conditioners, window units. But the HVAC is what we're seeing in most new construction today as it combines the, the two. Flip it over one way for heat, flip it over another way for AC. Anybody else get to flip your AC on today? I was burning up this afternoon. <laughs> I like running my AC in February. I feel the need to say that. Heat pumps is the combination of the heat and air. So when you flip it over, One way it pulls air in from the outside, pulls heat in. The other way it pushes the heat out, 
combination of our heat and air. The heat pump, the HVAC, that's what we see most commonly in North Carolina. Heat is measured in BTUs, British thermal units. These are stated in the thousands. This is just the measure of heat. Rating the equipment, the, the, the energy. Sometimes what we're seeing, especially in our two-story homes, um, dual heating systems. So you have the larger heating source for the downstairs, and then you have a smaller one for the upstairs. We all know heat rises. And so in the summer times, your unit's running really, really hard to keep the upstairs cool. So now what we're running into is dual units, one for upstairs, one for down. If you're when you're showing property, you see two units outside, that should be a little red flag to you. If you walk inside and you see a thermostat upstairs and a thermostat downstairs. It's going to be a dual heating, help regulate that heat, save on your energy bill. When it comes to buildings, there are certain codes, certain regulations that builders have to follow. Um, government regulations, they provide us with these minimum construction standards. The purpose is safety. So that's the point of our building codes to require buildings to build with those minimum construction standards. Obviously, the builder can go more than the minimum, but they do set regulations. HUD homes uh, may have different building restrictions. Uh, for example, when we talked about FHA and VA loans, we said not all FHA and VA loans are going to get, not all properties are going to get FHA or VA approval. That's because they have different HUD minimum standards. And then your contractor licensing, also known as your general contractor. It's an interesting side of real estate as well. They can help coordinate large project projects, coordinate with subcontractors. Anybody remember? I think this is a unit three. Anybody remember we said in North Carolina, if any project is more than X amount, we need a contractor. You guys remember the X amount? I love watching those hamsters spin. Yeah, yeah. Look at you guys go. So in North Carolina, if your project is more than $30,000, you need that general contractor. That was not fair, 8.30 on a Wednesday night. I'm sorry. <laughs> Guess what? We like 18 and 16, don't we? Green star, short, sweet, to the point. Again, it's the key terms. I just threw a lot of words at you guys. I wouldn't expect you to see more than one or two quest test questions, so I don't want you spending all your study time, but I do think it's worth flipping through. You know, the one thing in unit 16, all those key words are bolded for you. So at least flipping through and paying attention to those bolded words they might give you an extra test, an extra point or two on your test. So it can't hurt you to look that over. Obviously all of our study time, not all of it, but most of it is still in seven, eight, nine, and 10, 14 and 15, 21, 17. So those key terms, the key point review is on page 431. And then your student quiz, 432.
Questions? So tomorrow, tomorrow we'll Kahoot, uh, 17 and 19 Kahoot. And then we're gonna start on our license law and commission rule. So we'll be state specific stuff tomorrow, starting tomorrow. We won't get through it tomorrow. Uh, we'll still have more to go in the next week, um, but that's our, that's where we are. That's the last big section, you guys. So we're, we're getting there. Hang on to your hats, right? Do you have any questions, comments, concerns? We all good? Have a great night. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Thank you.